Why should we not lay up treasures on this Bring earth? all the tithe to the store. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. No one can serve two masters. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He who loves silver will not be satisfied earth is with the silver. Lord's and the fullness thereof, even the people. Every the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Hello and welcome to Faith and Finance. The program today is going to address a very, very important topic in our money management, making major purchases. Two of the things that families purchase that are big ticket items are transportation vehicles and our home. Those are the two big ones. And if they're done properly, uh, they can be a lot easier. The book that we're using is Faith and Finance and the chapter on making major purchases has all this information in it as well. In addition, we have a Spanish edition, Fe y Finances, that you can look at if you prefer the Spanish. This is a 170 page book and it's spiral bound so you can open it up and use it as a workbook and there's areas where you can practice the things that we're learning here. These books are available at the Adventist Book Center and you'll see the, the 800 number that you can call on the screen. We're looking at uh, a very important Bible text because the Bible outlines this principle. We've looked at it before. It's Luke the 14th chapter and verse 28 tells us, for which of you intending to build a tower, that would be like a house in the wall back in the old cities, does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. So we're gonna talk about something very valuable to know. All major purchases require a strategy that seeks two things, quality and economy in the same transaction. This strategy is often overlooked when impulse buying is practiced. Now, do you understand what we mean by quality and economy? In other words, when you go to a dealership to buy a car, for example, if you don't like the price, you don't want a cheaper model. What you want is a better price on the good model. That's what I'm talking about here. So we'll first address transportation decisions. Transportation is important for people. Many people in large cities don't even have an automobile because they don't need one. They use public transport. But if you have the need for an automobile, that purchase is a very important thing to understand. So I'm going to tell you the difference between buying new or used and then also how to do it when you decide what you want. Dealers must sell a certain number of cars each month to maintain their business and their ordering status from the manufacturer. They are ready to discount the sale price at the end of the month and especially at the end of the year. So if you like to trade cars often, buying a late model used car will keep you from paying so much depreciation. But if you like to keep your cars for a long time, 10 or 12 years or more, you may wish to purchase the best new car price that you can. That's what I've practiced in my own life. The average used car in the United States sells for about $10,000. It's hard for people my age to believe that, but it is actually true from statistics that we know today. Americans spend over a hundred billion dollars a year just to purchase some 20 million used cars in America. Well, where do our used cars come from? One of the things that we know is that dealer lots, and these are trade-in cars that uh, dealers have taken as a trade-in for a new car. They often have some kind of a warranty with them, frequently in better condition, lower mileage than cars at other sellers. And then there's used car dealers, and they only deal with used cars. These cars come from dealers, that is that so high mileage that the new car dealer would not want to sell it, and also auto auctions. And you can imagine what cars are like if they must go through the auction. But the cars that these used car dealers have are generally older, have higher mileage, and they also obtain some cars that have been poorly maintained. Then there's a third area or way that you can buy a used car. This would be a private party vehicle that you may see in the classified section of the newspaper or sitting out in someone's yard. Uh, if they've been well maintained, they could be a good deal and they could be a nightmare if they've not been well maintained. By the way, just because there's a car sitting out in for someone's yard for sale doesn't mean that the guy who lives in the house is the owner. Where I travel back and forth on New Hampshire Avenue in Washington, D.C., there's a man that has a different used car there every week. He actually gets cars from dealers 
dealers and sells them at his yard. Obviously, he must have a dealer's license, but it doesn't mean that he knows what the, the transportation history and the maintenance history and all those kinds of things are concerned. So I will just tell you, there's a thing that we must beware about. And I tell people, most used cars even at dealerships are sold as is. The seller assumes no responsibility for any needed repairs, regardless of any oral claims by the seller. Oh, I'll take care of that if anything happens in 30 days. If there is a warranty mentioned, you must get it in writing. I also tell people every used car is for sale for some reason. If you can figure out that reason, you're way ahead of the game. It might just be the guy's being transferred out of the country, going to the service or something like that, and the car's been well maintained. It might be that a couple gets married and they decide they don't need two cars, they're just gonna have one. In those cases, if you know why it's for sale. It might be a lemon and it's costing people a lot to maintain it, but you should figure that out. That's one of the reasons if you buy used cars, a late model used car is probably a better deal. Another thing about used cars is that inspection is a good idea. The appearance of a used car can be deceptive. A rusty body may have a well-maintained engine inside, or a clean, shiny exterior may conceal a major drivetrain problem. So I'm going to tell you, you should have a trained and trusted mechanic of your choice check out the car to estimate its present condition and determine the cost of needed repairs. A number of things actually uh, indicate uh, the value of a used car. One of them is the number of miles driven, another is the features and option, and certainly the age of the car. You can find the price of similar cars in newspapers, on car lots, on the internet, at such sites as Edmunds used cars, and so on. Those are things to think about. Now, what about buying a new car? It's always fun to shop for cars, at least if you're a man, and most men enjoy shopping for cars, but things that I will tell you I think are very valuable. The decision to buy a new car should never be based on impulse or emotional need. Instead, it should be based on your transportation needs and your financial readiness. Once you've determined through research which car you want to purchase, you can check out the available options for that model on the internet and come up with what I call a ballpark estimate of the price that you can expect to pay. It's interesting that many purchasers nowadays come to car dealerships with all this information in mind and there's very little negotiation because the purchaser has a good idea of what he expects and what he is willing to pay. Now there's two kinds of prices that dealers have on new cars. One is called the sticker price, and it's printed usually on a form that's posted on a side window of the vehicle with a suggested retail price of the car. There are very few purchasers who actually would use that as the pay purchase price. There are exceptions, of course, for rare kinds of cars or cars in great demand, but typically that is a price that you can negotiate down from. The label talks about what accessories it has, and uh, those are added to the base price of the car, and you come up with a suggested retail price. There's another price, and that's called the invoice price. This is what the dealer actually pays for the vehicle, or at least about what he pays for it. Obviously, they have discounts from the manufacturer and so on. But it's an amount less than the sticker price. And the difference between the invoice and the sticker price is the range of where you can typically negotiate. Sometimes near the end of the year, dealers are willing to take less than their invoice price even, and that's when some people can make good deals. The dealer cost can be researched through following sources. In other words, you can actually find out what the dealer invoice price is for a typical car. Edmunds new car prices, consumer reports, and of course libraries and bookstores have information on this as well. What should you know about buying a new car? Well, you can use the dealer cost information to negotiate a deal that's only a couple hundred dollars over the cost or right at cost or under cost depending. But if you know that information, that will be very helpful to you. To prevent confusion, now please let me underscore something here. I am a Christian and I'm very happy to operate my life within Christian principles. But the Bible says that God's followers should be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It means that you should manage your money wisely because you're handling God's money. So here's the point I want to make here. When you 
to avoid any confusion when you're wanting to know the true price of the car the dealer is offering for sale, do not mention a trade-in until the cost of the new car has been settled. Then you can ask the dealer how much he's willing to pay for your old car. If the offer price is not acceptable to you, sell your old car on your own. I think you'll find that to be good counsel. You should also uh, plan to avoid debt if possible, especially long-term debt. Take the purchase money from your transportation savings account. If you don't have enough in that part of your budget, then you'll need to borrow the balance. But just remember, pay it off as quickly as you can. The interest that you pay on automobiles is not tax deductible as compared to interest that you pay on your home mortgage, for example. When it relates to the car dealer and his offer to you, I'm going to tell you what I would recommend. Sometimes the dealer will offer you an either or situation. Either you can have a rebate or you get some low interest rate. And I believe that you're better off taking the uh, rebate rather than getting the low interest rate. Get your own financing through a credit union or whatever. Get the car as cheaply as you can. A real point that I've tried to practice is when your car is paid off, you should put an amount equal to your car payment each month into your transportation savings account so that you can pay cash when it's time to replace your car. By the way, since this doesn't happen very often, typically car salespeople will try to talk you out of paying for your car with cash. And the reason that they do that is because frequently dealers have rebates or kickbacks from the lender so that they get a portion of the money from the interest. But you're talking about your interest here, so your best deal would be to pay cash if possible. Those are important. We also should mention proper maintenance. It extends the life of the vehicle. It's in your long-term advantage to service and maintain your car according to the owner's manual. In fact, Consumer Reports found that if you keep your car going for 200,000 miles and 15 years, you may save as much as what the car cost you originally. Now, I'm sure people, you'd have to maintain it well, but many of the engines in today's cars are actually designed to go that far if you'll maintain them properly and uh, use good maintenance techniques. Now, what about leasing a car? People ask me this question a lot, and I'll just tell you the bottom line is I don't think it's a good idea for people uh, who are, you know, just private individuals. It may be good if you're in business for yourself and you lease a vehicle and you can, you know, deduct as a business expense the money that you put into the car. But typically, uh, a lease situation is you put a monthly payment, a down payment also, for a set period of time, usually two or five years. At the end of the lease term, the vehicle is usually returned to the leasing company. I'm going to share with you three reasons why I don't think a lease is good for the average consumer. First of all, you have no ownership interest in the vehicle in spite of all the money you've invested. Second one, you have to meet the requirements similar to qualify for the lease as you would for credit. And the third one, you may have to pay additional costs for extra mileage. If it goes over a certain amount, say 12000 or 15000 a year, you have to pay for certain repairs. And if you return the car early or even if you move to another state, there can be additional charges as well. Now we come to something very interesting, and that is the housing decision. And I want to share with you some basic information that will be very helpful to you in this idea. There are actually some benefits to renting. In an ideal world, people would own their own homes, but there's some advantages. Mobility, for example. There's no hassle of trying to sell your house if you're, when you're ready to move on. There are fewer responsibilities. The owner of the house that you rent handles all the maintenance, the property taxes, and the insurance, and so on. That it would be the casualty insurance. If you are renting, obviously, you would want to have renter's insurance for your own personal property in the house. And then, of course, another advantage, there's lower initial costs when getting into a rental house or an apartment, typically a deposit and a first month's rent ahead, that kind of thing, instead of like a 20% down payment. But 
the renting may be valuable for those who are just temporary in a location or maybe a short-term rental, a short-term lease when you move to a new area to try to get the lay of the land and really where you want to be. And for those who don't want the responsibility of home ownership and uh, those who don't have sufficient savings to make a down payment on a home. But there's some disadvantages to renting. And uh, I think that you understand that the renters do not enjoy the financial advantages that homeowners do. For example, tenants cannot deduct mortgage interest and property taxes uh, and benefit also from home equity that builds up its advantage. Probably the worst disadvantage is if you rent your whole life, when you get to that third segment after your earning years, even when your income is lower, you still have to pay rent out each month. So in an ideal world, your house would be paid for before retirement. Uh, there are different kinds of homes that you could, rent, uh, could uh, live in. A single family home, a multifamily unit like a duplex or something or a townhouse, condominium, cooperative housing, manufactured homes, or even mobile homes. And I want to talk about these different kinds of homes and what I would recommend to you. And the book actually talks a lot about these as well. What about mobile homes? Well, there are uh, important considerations. To be real honest with you, I lived, my family had a mobile home. We lived in mobile homes for 10 or 12 years when I was growing up. So it's not, you know, a bad thing, but you may lose value over time, making them very difficult to sell. Also, financing may be difficult to obtain. And sometimes there's poor construction quality. They call them mobile homes, but they were really not designed in most cases, as you may know, to move more than one time. So what about buying a home? What should you do? Well, think of this. First of all, you may not get all the features you want in your first home, but financial advisors suggest that you get into the housing market by purchasing what you can afford. And as you move up into the housing market, maybe your second or your third home can include more of the features that you want. Remember that your first home is typically not your dream home. Unfortunately, many people try to get into their dream home and that causes them really, really big problems. So when are you ready to buy a house? Well, here's my suggestion. When your debts are either paid off, that is your consumer debt, or under control, and that would include, for example, student loans, those kinds of things. A second prerequisite would be that you have 20% down payment to avoid private mortgage insurance. And the third one is that you can afford the monthly payments, including taxes and insurance, usually not to consume more than 35% of your gross income. In the uh, subprime mortgage meltdown that we experienced in the United States, a number of people were up to 60% of their uh, gross income to make payments. And that's just way out of control. In addition, no down payment. In other words, all three of the prerequisites I just mentioned to you were not met by most of the people in the, prime mortgage, uh, in the subprime mortgage situation. Now I wanna talk to you about prepaying your mortgage. In other words, how do you pay down the mortgage? Uh, I would suggest when we talked about getting out of debt in a prior program that your mortgage be the last thing you pay off because it's usually the biggest debt and of course the interest that you do pay is still tax deductible. But there's some things that you can do. Because of severely inflated home prices, uh, real estate should actually increase over time. But what we saw in the uh, last four or five years in the United States is it increased too fast. And that made people pay huge amounts for houses. And then when the price went down to a moderate level, many people were upside down on their mortgage or had to have a foreclosure situation. But what I can tell you is since houses cost so much, even though the Bible talks about a seven year plan, what you would have to do likely is either get a 15 or 30 year mortgage and then try to accelerate the mortgage so that you can pay it off much quicker. And that you can do by prepaying the principal. Something else that we want to consider when buying a home is that if you don't have 20% down, uh, lending laws require you to purchase 
PMI or private mortgage insurance. And this is not to your benefit so much as it protects the lender, though you pay the premium, it protects the lender from foreclosure loss due to their risk of making loans that exceed 80%, which is called you know, a high risk loan. So that's, these are a subprime mortgage, if you please. Anybody who has less than 80% will pay a higher interest rate than somebody with 80% only in the loan to uh, the loan value of their home. So private mortgage insurance allows lenders to give loans to potential homeowners who have little or no cash for the down payment. Borrowers should notice and note for sure that private mortgage insurance is private insurance which can be canceled under certain circumstances. That's if you pay the mortgage down below the 80% level. While high risk FHA lenders are protected by mutual mortgage insurance, or we call it MMI, and such policies can only be canceled by paying off the home, whole mortgage. So even if you get below 80% with an FHA loan, you can't cancel the private mortgage insurance. By the way, the private mortgage insurance can be $150 or $200 a month. Think of how great that would be if it could go on your principal instead of going to an insurance uh, office. This is important. I would tell you that the simplest way to avoid private mortgage insurance is to have a 20% down payment. Then PMI never becomes an issue. Now, I'm going to show you something very simple. And those of you that have the book, it's on page 89. We have an amortization schedule. And I'm just going to refer to it and read one page here, so that, or just one line of it, so that we can make an advantage here. This is an amortization schedule is actually a computer printout of your loan. And uh, it has generally five columns. The number of the principal, that is one to 360, if you have a 30 year mortgage. Then the next column is the payment amount, how much you pay. And then you have the interest that goes to the bank. And then the principal or how much your loan is reduced by. And then finally, your balance once that debt is paid. Now, the amortization schedule in the book, Faith and Finance, is a $200,000 loan, and it's figured at 7.5% because these vary. I realize that sometimes it can get down as low as 5%, but 7.5% and for 30 years. Now, what I want to tell you is something interesting. If there's no prepayment penalty, and certainly you wouldn't want to get into a loan that had a prepayment penalty, then you can understand something very interesting. That is, any time you make a regular payment, then you can add as many principal payments as you could afford to it at that time. In this particular case, when you make payment number one, the principal amount is $148, and you're giving the bank $1,250 for interest. But what I tell people, if you have the money to make the next payment, then you could add $149 to your first payment. And by doing that with just $149, you can make the second payment at the same time you make the first payment. And next month, your payment will be number three. And oh, by the way, you just saved yourself $1,249 that you never have to pay. Let me make it even more simple. If you look at the amortization schedule, you'll see that in the second year, in the whole year, you pay $1,986. My suggestion is instead of putting money away in an IRA or something like that, why not put $2,000 on your home mortgage at the end of the year? And guess what you would do? I, by the way, don't put $2,000, put $1,986.80, exactly what your amortization schedule says. If you do that, you would save an entire year's worth of interest, save yourself $14,794 that you never have to pay, and your next month's payment will be payment number 25. You can see this, it's all explained in the book. It's very interesting material to look at, and I think you'll be in a great advantage to do that. It almost seems like, uh, you know, it's, it's not true. In fact, I've had so many people say, can you really do this? The answer is yes. If there's no prepayment penalty, you can make as, in, as many additional principal payments anytime you make a regular payment that carries all the interest up to date. And then you save the equivalent amount beside it. So let's go on to another area that I will suggest to you. Those that can afford it, if you get a 15 year mortgage, it pays the 30 year mortgage off in half the time and a significant amount of interest is saved. 
Most 15 year mortgages are offered at a savings of one half of a percent on the interest rate. So if a current 30 year rate is like seven and a half percent like the amortization shows in the book, you can probably get a 15 year loan for 7%. Now the, the interesting thing is how much you save. And you can see that the total interest that you would pay on a 30 year mortgage is 303,000 and the total interest on a 15 year mortgage is 123,000. So you save $179,000 that you never have to pay and can benefit your family if you pay it off in half the time. In addition, you're half the, you're, you have the security of home ownership in half the time that you would normally have for a 15 year mortgage. Uh, or a whole 30 year mortgage. Let me also underscore this. I know I've said it in a previous program, but here's a good time to say it again when we're talking about home mortgages. And that is when you're paying your house down, uh, sometimes uh, your CPA may say, don't pay your house off. You need the interest deduction. But I always tell people, what time is it when your CPA tells you that? The answer is time to get a new CPA. Everybody should know by now that it is not wise to spend a dollar to save a quarter. You're much better off with your house paid for and that's important stuff. Now a generation ago, it wasn't possible to overload on mortgages because lenders didn't allow it. In other words, they would make you make a down payment. But in recent years, lenders began issuing what I would call unmanageable mortgages. A down payment, once a critical device for screening potential borrowers, disappeared in the bank's greed to draw more people into their interest-making machine. One study showed that people who make a down payment of less than 5% of the purchase price of their homes are 10 to 15 times uh, it's more than that, 15 to 20 times more likely to default than those who put 20% down. So this is valuable information to know. During the subprime mortgage mess, banks were deliberately caught issuing mortgages to families that could not afford them with the ultimate aim of foreclosing on them. Of course, this backfired on lending institutions because so many houses went on the market that the total values went down. But nonetheless, I want you to understand it's very valuable for you to to get your home paid off if possible. We understand that becoming debt free, this was a statement the late Larry Briquette made that I think is very valuable. And he stated becoming debt free, including the home mortgage should be the first investment goal for any young couple or person. Once you've achieved that, then and only then should you invest in other areas. In other words, it's a major thing to get that taken care of. It builds up your net worth. It gives you a sense of security and you know what's happening with your finances. So we've talked about two areas of major purchases. By the way, some of the budget busting things like a airplane or a powerboat or whatever are major purchases that aren't really planned. And so what I'm suggesting to you, if you make these other purchases, make sure you do so with a plan in mind so that it does not bust your budget and you can live within your income.